My name is David Botel, and I am an Associate Director with CEDA and work across our Public Interest Technology Initiative. I am based in Sydney and would like to begin today by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose land I live and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. CEDA acknowledges that today and every day we are on Aboriginal land committed to recognition and reconciliation. We respect elders and we support their stated aspirations. One of the many issues shaping trust in technology is digital inclusion. And in acknowledging Indigenous Australians today, I also invite you to reflect that as per the 2020 Australian Digital Inclusion Index, increases in digital inclusion for Indigenous Australians have stalled and currently sit well below the national average, driven primarily by issues relating to affordability. If Australia is to emerge as a digital leader and maximise the benefits of technology, we must ensure that those benefits work for all Australians including those that face barriers accessing the digital world. CEDA has focused on today's topic throughout 2021 under our Public Interest Tech Initiative. Our Trust in Tech Priorities paper released in May examined the, government, examined the role of government stewardship of emerging technologies and how this can foster and enhance community trust. Our paper called for the creation of objective and transparent tech assessment processes encouraged Australia to continue its important role in global technology data governance and regulation, and made the recommendation for a federal chief technologist. CEDA's Public Interest Tech Initiative will continue to pursue these priorities and later this year will further examine trust and governance issues relating to artificial intelligence and opportunities presented to the Australian economy through greater AI adoption. During today's discussion, we invite viewers to follow CEDA on Twitter at CEDA underscore news and to join today's conversation using the hashtag trust in tech. We also invite viewers to participate in the discussion using the pigeonhole app. Participant, uh, sorry, viewers can directly enter the live stream page for login details or uh, access pigeonhole via the details shown on screen. Within Pigeonhole, you can enter your own questions or view and vote on the questions of others via the app. In making today's discussion possible, I would like to thank today's sponsor, Technology One. Moderating today's discussion is Technology One's Chief Operating Officer, Stuart McDonald, a technology professional with a diverse 20 years experience. He is well placed to facilitate today's discussion. I'm now delighted to hand over to Stuart to introduce our incredible speakers and chair today's discussion. Thank you and hello everybody. I'm Stuart MacDonald, Chief Operating Officer, Technology One. Welcome to today's CETA live stream, Building Technology in Trust, or Building Trust in Technology. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to those joining us online and welcome those leading this important discussion today. The Honorable Victor Dominello, MP, New South Wales, Minister for Digital and Minister for Customer Service. Natasha Brack, Director and Group Head of Technology at Edelman. Giselle Kaptirin, Senior Director and Public Sector Strategy at Salesforce. And Lucinda Longcroft, Director and Government Affairs and Public Policy, Australia, New Zealand at Google. When I looked at the question, building trust in technology, I see the term technology in this context exceedingly complex because of its definition. What is technology? Where is it going? And most importantly, who's delivering it? Te technology by its very nature is ever evolving, to deliver faster, cheaper, and more efficient outcomes. I use the case in point here at Technology One, where we've taken our customers on a SaaS journey for more than six years now. At the beginning of this journey, the vast majority of our customers focused on, why would I move to SaaS? What is the point? And as we move forward to six years later, it's not a question of why, it's a question of when. The education is already there. They see the value in cybersecurity. They see the value in sovereignty of their data. So now the education process is complete, and now they need to understand how to adopt it. And so as I unpack 
this very simple question of building trust in technology, I think it comes down to a clear education of the technology, describing the benefits of it, and most importantly, the clear and transparent delivery of it to the end user. Again, in the world of SaaS, putting things in the cloud, specifically personal data, employees, ratepayers, students, is of great concern. Regardless of the increasing security protocols and thresholds, such as IRAP and IRAP protected, for which technology one is certified, it's the companies that are managing it, their strategy, their direction, and the transparency of delivery that is paramount to market adoption. I always think of Google's corporate code of conduct, don't be evil. And when I think of this, it sums up the issue. If you look at the panel today, the representatives for the world's leading tech companies and govern government departments, we have the IP to build amazing and revolutionary technology, but if the public does not trust Salesforce, Google, or the New South Wales government, then it'll never get adopted. In technology one, innovation is at the core of what we do. And we are proud of our 34 years of continuously pushing the market adoption of evolving tech. And we partner with independent parties consistently to validate our understanding and strategy. It is this very topic for me right now that is supporting the publication of a report with IBRS that found that SAS adoption in Australia and the federal government, state government, local government, and corporate sector would save Australian economy $224 billion over 10 years. However, if these sectors don't trust us, then the technology will never be implemented and there will never be the benefits that should be realized. I'm honored to be part of this discussion today and very much look forward to hearing from the panel, but most importantly, the Q&A to follow. And with that, please, may I welcome Natasha Brack, Director of Group Head of Technology Edelman's to kick things off. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, it's great to be here today to talk through Edelman's Trust Barometer for 2021. Um, for those who aren't familiar with Edelman, we're an uh, integrated communications agency who's been running this survey for more than two decades in 28 countries around the world. The survey measures trust and confidence in a number of sectors, um, but really across four institutions, business, media, government and NGOs. Um, needless to say, it's been a year like no other and the lasting effects of the pandemic on things like um, jobs, healthcare um, and the clearly widening inequality gap has really been brought to the forefront as we're having to navigate these complex social issues in a way that we never have previously. Now, when we look at trust, we do so with four key institutions. We have business, NGOs, government. Um, and for the first time ever this year, we found that my employer is actually the most trusted institution with media now distrusted by the Australian public for the first time. The trust gap continues to deepen in our country, um, which given the year we've had is fairly unsurprising. The people who are most disadvantaged by healthcare, job losses, those who tend to consume media less so um, and often through a social feed are really feeling the trust deficit. The way that we measure trust is through two groups of people, the informed public, which is the top line, and the mass population at the bottom. Now, the way that we identify who the informed public are um, tend to be university educated. Um, they tend to be in the top quadrant of income in the country, household income earners. They tend to have a really diverse media appetite versus the mass population. Now, if you compare the data from January 2020 on the left to January this year, you can see that trust was in a pretty healthy way. 
Um, and in some respects, that, that was a little perplexing. Um, but it's fair to say that Australians were feeling uh, buoyant. It appeared or the perception was that we beat COVID, the economy was bouncing back, the job rate was high, um, and thus the general public was in a, in a fairly good way and fairly trusting broadly. For the informed public, we managed to maintain that trust over the next six months. So you can see up to May, um, there was barely a drop at all. But for the mass population, that drop was fairly significant. And we can attribute that to things like um, the embattled vaccine rollout, uh, chaos in Canberra, women's rights issues, um, the ACCC in tech was a big one, and certainly things like the media bargaining code have all played their part. Which brings us to tech in our in, uh, trust in our sector in technology. We've seen the greatest loss in the sector, uh, with general business actually increasing by 11 points and the tech sector decreasing by five points. Now, we know that Australians have a complicated relationship with technology and that there's a lot of fear around new tech in particular, that the pace of tech is moving faster than the government can regulate, and that's causing additional distrust and discomfort for Aussies. And you can see here that, in fact, technology was the only sector that we saw a decrease in trust, which is a bit of a worry. Um, in fact, there were significant increases in sectors such as financial services, telco, and somewhat unsurprisingly in healthcare. And this is a snapshot of how Australia compares to other countries around the world, um, with tech having reached all-time lows in 17 out of 27 countries that, um, that we do this survey. I mean, there was more significant drop in other places, but we've had our fair share here as well. Why? Um, we know that our relationship with technology is really complicated and I think the past year has highlighted the responsibility that the tech industry has and big tech in particular to its global citizens. The pandemic has heightened people's fears and trust in tech has really suffered. Big tech has been seen not only to escalate but also to profiteer from the devastation of things like misinformation with politics and healthcare, job losses through innovation, breaches in data privacy and many, many more things. The good news is we have a clear roadmap for recovery um, with trust in our sector. But tech companies have to accept that responsibility and take the lead on key issues. They need to do that with empathy. They need to listen to people's fears and address them. They have to be trustworthy in the content that they're providing. And really, as a collective, they need to take action to ensure that we're addressing some of these key societal problems. So with that, I will pass over to the Minister, Dominello. Well, thank you, Natasha. Uh, can I also thank you for uh, allowing me to present at this uh, informative event. Uh, when I think about technology and trust, and particularly from the delivery of government services, you know, I, I think there's five main pillars uh, that we have to focus on. The first one is privacy. Second one is security. Third one is transparency. Fourth is ethics. And fifth is inclusion. And once you've got those pillars in place, you can build pretty much any digital product you like uh, because then those four five pillars build trust. But without those, uh, then whatever you, service you deliver, uh, you might take one step forward, ten steps back. And it really is like that, particularly in relation to government services, because the big difference between government and uh, industry is that there is an arm of government that can put people in jail. Industry can't do that. So that's why government has to, more than ever before, build that layer, a very, very solid foundational layer of trust before it delivers services. One of the challenges we have as government is that 
when you look at the Googles and the Apples and the Amazons and the Netflix and the, and the Uber Eats and everything else, everything is at the palm of your hand and, and the service delivery is almost instantaneous and seamless, intuitive. So if government does not keep pace with that, then that in itself uh, creates a trust deficit because they are used to service delivery at this level, but they're getting it at this level uh, from government, which is far from uh, optimal, and that again builds a trust deficit. So that's another challenge that governments have to have uh, in making sure that we stay abreast in terms of you know what service delivery should look like. Now, I've been very fortunate to be the minister responsible for um, Department of Customer Service, which is just two years old, but before that, um, innovation. And in in that in that quadrant, I've had Service New South Wales for about I think five six years now. Service New South Wales is is in many ways the the front door for a lot of government services, and, and a lot of people understand Service New South Wales. But what we created in Service is a in many ways, an enviable startup culture where we can move really, really fast. But I keep keep saying to the team that you know we can't deliver products and services unless there's that trust uh, platform. And we've had our challenges. There's been you know uh, security and privacy breaches along the way, but we've had to be very transparent. So I, I might pass over to Giselle Capterian on that point because I, I too want to get him get my teeth into the Q&A because I think that will be a really interesting discussion moving forward. Thanks very much, Minister. And actually, you know, some of those points that you mentioned there are absolutely um, pertinent to the, the framing of the research that we've undertaken recently. And, and I'll uh, start back with bringing in some of Stuart's comments as well at the top here. You know, building trust in technology and using technology to build trust are part of that same equation. And we're already hearing those themes in, in the speakers those, thus far. And at Salesforce, um, a couple of years ago, just before the pandemic hit, actually, we decided to take what was essentially a hunch for us, a hypothesis based on our workings within our business and see if it held true for government. And in an elaborative, uh, collaborative project with BCG, we conducted research on the relationship between levels of trust in government and the quality of service delivery from government. And what we found was actually really compelling. There was a direct causal link between trust levels and the quality of service delivered. In fact, 90% of individuals surveyed said that the quality of the service they experienced influenced the levels of trust in government. And uh, more recently, we, we ran those numbers again um, post-COVID, uh, post, I must say, post the crisis part of the first initial phase of COVID, and we saw a 5% increase on exactly those levels. And uh, a hypothesis from that is that because more Australians were turning to government for health and economic lifelines than ever before, they really saw the value of good uh, government service delivery and the impact it had in their everyday lives in ways that they previously hadn't had to contend with. Um, and this hypothesis is further backed up by the fact that we saw that digitally mature governments like New South Wales and, and our side it was across ANZ uh, and the New Zealand government who had existing cloud technologies in place, who ran multidisciplinary teams in their service delivery orgs, did really well on the trust scores compared with those who are less further along the the digital uh, journey within government. And so what we found essentially at the heart of that is that service delivery is a proxy for trust in the way that the end, the customer receives it. Um, and what we, we then take this the next level. So what does this actually mean for government? And what does that mean for the, the, the lessons we've learned from the private sector as well? And I'm just going to hit on three major points out of this. Um, customer expectation and what that actually looks like the need to deliver a net tangible asset. And we've already heard this theme already in uh, the discussions from the other speakers today. And the role of transparency in delivering the, the use of that technology, how data is going to be used, how the technology is used, and how it delivers that benefit to the individual. So just quickly on customer expectation, it really comes as no surprise that the expectation has been largely shaped by our interactions with those organisations that you mentioned, Minister, um, uh, you know, the, the Amazons, the Googles, the, the Ubers, and so, so forth. And so what we actually found was that customers, and we use that term, 
term. Now, government's also adopted that that phraseology, denoting a much bigger shift in in uh, how you approach the end user. Um, that customers expect that same level of uh, digital maturity and service delivery in in dealing with government. In fact. Uh, 25, almost 25% of Australians expect government service delivery to be as good as the digital leaders like Amazon, like Google. And it's also really clear what that customer is actually looking for. They're looking for four basic things that you and I would all easily relate to. Ease of use, access to information, seamlessness, as you referred to, Minister, and fundamentally, this transparent use of data. The second issue is this net tangible benefit, which is, you know, at the end of the day, our research confirmed what I think we all would hypothesize to be true is that you're willing to share information with an organization and entity if you are assured of receiving a net tangible benefit for doing so. In the private sector, we know what that is. It's a, it's a few clicks here and there to get what you want. Um, and you'll keep going back to that that. Um, company if they delivered what you, what you expected out of that experience. Same thing hold tr- holds true with the public sector. I'm happy to give more uh, government more information if mm. it's going to help me find a quicker route to work in the morning, back in the days when we could, um, or if it's going to alert me to a, um, a, a service or I, I could be eligible for some um, uh, service from government that I wasn't sure that I, I wouldn't have been aware of otherwise, like a you know a study loan, a young professional study loan or some such. And finally, transparency. You know, at the end of the day, our customers really want the same thing, whether you're in government or the private sector. They want to understand that their data is secure, that it's not being used against their best interests, and it's not being used without their consent. And we saw that again when it came through to using downloading New South Wales um, uh, app for for uh, QR check-ins. You know, it was really clear how my gov- my data was going to be used. It was going to be held for 28 days, and it, it told me how who was going to have access to that data. Same thing with. Um, uh, at Salesforce, for example, we have at any time you you, you can see how your gov- how your data is being treated. You can go to trust.salesforce.com where you can see how our systems are performing around the world, and how you finally how you build in equity and transparency into that data is that final point. Um, at Salesforce, we've actually built, uh, developed an Office of Ethical and Humane Use, which embeds into the technology that we develop that ethical use of technology, safeguarding human rights, data privacy, and human safety. Um, and all of this is to say, yeah, but why? Why to go to such efforts? At the end of the day, it creates this virtuous cycle of trust, where you, whether you're in the private sector or the public sector. When a, an, a customer is more willing and, and feels safer in sharing information with you, that that organisation is able to use that information to deliver better, more targeted services that, in the end of the day, keep delivering that tangible benefit for the end user. I'm really excited to hear some of the questions uh, in, in uh, the chat. So at that point, I'll, I'll hand over to Lucinda. Thank you, Giselle, and thanks also to Stuart and to Cedar, and, and thank you to all those in the audience who, who've taken the time to, to sit with us today. Uh, I do know that this is a hard time for all of us. Uh, I'm also grateful that in many, unlike in many parts of the world, uh, we as Australians have the privilege of decades of investment in digital infrastructure that allows us to meet digitally and share these stories. Uh, Like my colleagues, I I want to acknowledge the contributions of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples because as well as the land on which we all meet, uh, their contribution to the vibrancy and culture of the Australian digital landscape can't be underestimated. Uh, So we're here today to talk about trust, Uh, so many facets that the Minister, Giselle and others have already raised, but um, from Google's perspective, I'd like to share a few perceptions because trust is is not a one-way street. Trust that people will do the right thing on our platforms enables us to give them more freedom and control. Trust that we will protect the interests of someone using Google's platforms underpins their willingness to use the platforms at all, and by extension, the government's ability to strike a balance between red tape and innovation. Australians who use our platforms need to trust both that their government is ensuring the technology they use is being operated in their interests, in our interests, and that the government is not using that same technology to intrude unjustly into their lives. 
perhaps most importantly, in a democracy like ours, those who are struggling and vulnerable need to be able to trust that technology will close the gap, not widen it. Google was created back in 1998, established in Australia some 20 years ago, with the mission of making information universally accessible and useful. It wasn't created with advertising or any other business model in mind. We had to find a way to make our services sustainable while keeping Google services free and therefore inclusive and open to everyone, hence advertising. As a company founded upon the principle of empowering people, we've worked constantly to ensure that we're collecting the minimal amount of information and data and anonymizing and protecting that information to continue to provide our services in a free and inclusive way. Over time, we've grown quite large, it's fair to say, um, and we've been able to innovate in an astounding number of products and even build world-spanning infrastructure that supports people around the world as they search for and exchange information as we create videos of protecting their personal and business information, reaching customers and delving into new areas of scientific and technical achievement. But as we've grown, so has the scrutiny. In 2021, we find ourselves part of an economy filled with hundreds of thousands of digital businesses, both natives here in Australia and established businesses transforming using technology. And although the positive impact of this transformation on our lives is undeniable, we're left with real questions about how it is affecting our economies and societies. Trust at its core is about understanding. To trust technology, we need to understand what it's doing and why. The level of understanding needed will differ between users of the technology, regulators, and those making decisions about national policy, but we all need to come together in good faith to build this understanding. Because without it, trust is low and scepticism and division is rife, resulting in poor outcomes for the public. Today in Australia, I see hope. We see policymakers, academics, industry and civil society experts building their expertise. We have deeper conversations built on evidence, thanks, Cedar. And in response, we ourselves are making increasing efforts towards transparency, be it in terms of our finances, our policy enforcement or how our technology works. Our hope is that with shared understanding, we can build shared purpose and work together on evidence-based policy, both regulatory and otherwise that aims towards a shared vision of what Australians expect and what an Australian technology ecosystem can be. Huge challenges remain unsolved. More than two and a half million Australians still don't have internet access. And although we are ever reaching to ensure those online with different abilities are able to use our products, be that through text to speech or subtitles for the visually or hearing impaired, or something simple like ensuring our color palettes are colorblind appropriate, the experience of the differently abled remains inconsistent across the web. Being the company we are, Google needs to respect the opportunity we have to help get this right, because Australians are people who use Google's products. They're our friends, family members and neighbours, and this conversation will affect all of us. I can talk more about some of the specific things we're doing in the panel discussion if it's of interest for now. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Lucinda, and thank you, everybody, for the comments to this point. Um, pigeonhole is open, and we've got quite a few questions coming in, but I'll, I'll kick off with the first one. So as a Queenslander to the to the minister, we're a little envious of your your um, ServiceNow application. We, we watch on it, and, and how do we get it across to the rest of the states? How did you get that comfort? So I'll take a simple example. Um, I would love, absolutely love to have my driver's license on my phone. But for some reason, how did you get your state government comfortable enough with the technology to trust the technology to be able to, to do that work? And then how do we bring that across the rest of the other states as an example? That, uh, <laughs> that's a big question. <laughs> uh, we, we designed big, built small. Uh, we changed the reporting structures inside the government. I think the two big things we did uh, were, one, we built the trust in terms of service delivery with Service New, service New South Wales. So, you know, uh, prior to the driver's licence, people had trust in our service delivering good uh, products and services. But then when we got into government in, in, 20, uh, in the last election, uh, we, we actually changed the way of thinking. So we, we created a, basically a, a COO role, which is my role, 
which so you got the CEO, which is the premier, CFO, which is the treasurer, and CEO, which is my job. My job is to make sure that we put the customers at the centre of everything we do, rather than agencies. So that gave me a lot more um, uh, authority uh, to say to other agencies, stop doing what you're doing. Uh, you're putting government first, not people first. So. Uh, in order to put, we've all, all agreed that service is going to be the predominant front door. Let's start loading products onto that because that's their touch. That's their touch point. That's their front door key to get into the, the big government mansion. And sure, there's no wrong door. They can go into broken glass window in the backyard. Get uh, they can go through other uh, passageways, but if they want the red carpet experience, it's through Service New South Wales. So it, it was a combination of. A, getting runs on the board, and B, changing the structure inside of government to give it authority to, to drive more product there. Thank you. Um, Lucinda, I'll, I'll throw this one to you, but if anybody else wants to pick it up after. Google is an interesting example where, where you highlighted that um, the application or the product and the company started with an intent to try to figure out how to monetize it after to keep it going. What is the roadmap to increase trust in technology and how was that roadmap formulated? It was a question from the pigeonhole. Oh, it's an exceptionally important question. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, and one that is at the heart of our business model uh, as well as at our, of our values. Uh, now, our, our platforms and products are extremely diverse. Um, at the core of all of those products, uh, we put the user first. Uh, and so uh, while our mission is to make the world's information universally accessible and useful, uh, we know that the business model that underpins that is one that uh, relies upon data, relies upon advertising, uh, and at its core it needs to ensure that our users trust our services. And that trust is built through ensuring that privacy uh, is built uh, into the core of our products. It's, we invest hugely in research and development, about 27.5 billion US dollars last year alone in improving the security of everything from our search products to our play billing to our app store and, and, uh, and other products. Uh, so trust is central to both values and business. Privacy is at the core of our, our practices as well as our products. We put the user first in all of those uh, in all of those situations by ensuring that uh, users have access, to, uh, access, trust, uh, safety, and control over their information, uh, as well as transparency about how it's being used. Uh, and uh, finally, we work with regulators. So we work very closely with the government and the government in Australia, as well as governments all around the world where we operate, uh, to work on regulations, guardrails, principles and governance uh, that broadly can be cohesive while uh, both enabling innovation to happen and, and to reach the government's goal of becoming a leading digital economy by 2030, but also ensure that uh, we maintain and ensure the well-being of Australians at the heart of everything we do here. Thank you for that. Um, and following that, Natasha, how much trust is lost because it's seen as corporate overseas companies uh, bringing in philosophies from other parts of the world and we don't share the same national individual citizen uh, interests? Another question from the pigeonhole. The, the study shows that I mean we have we look at we looked at we looked at trust in technology we look at trust in other sectors um, we do compare and contrast trust in Australia versus overseas I'm not sure that it's broken down into um, you know if there is you know a company like a, a Google or a Salesforce um, and what their global enterprise is doing and how that's being applied and adapted and modified in Australia I'm not sure that the data actually extrapolates the difference between what citizens are seeing in other countries and here I think what we absolutely know is that trust is dipping in the sector globally this is a global issue for citizens um, and it's one that the sector at large needs to find a solution for collectively. Um, we're not going to be able to do that, um, you know, business by business. It has to be 
business, it has to be NGO, it has to be government collectively, um, and ensuring that citizens actually feel like there is some significant movement um, because we, we've really had a hit in the last 12 months um, and, I, I, you know, and it'll take a significant amount of time for that to increase again. Great. Thank you. Do you want, can I Just, jump in off the back of that? Please, please. You know, it, it is really such an important uh, question and it, and it comes to, you know, a challenge that I think is obviously not specific to tech, it's not specific to government, not specific to any particular industry at all, but, but it comes down to this ecosystem challenge that all of us face when operating these major entities. You know, how do you allow your brand to continue to develop that systemic trust when you're entirely reliant in, in some instances on a third party or other players to maintain that trust um, momentum throughout the supply chain. You know, from, from a government's perspective, how many agencies are actually dependent on a, on a third party to, to deliver the service that the, the government has um, has developed? Same thing with, uh, you know, Google, a uh, Salesforce. Where, you know, our challenge is, is ensuring the brand and the trust that is attached to that brand uh, is maintained throughout the ecosystem. So right from the top, right through to the end user, they know that they're dealing with um, that particular company and what that expectation of that company actually is or what that expectation of government actually is. When you think about, you know, an Airbnb or an Uber, we don't know the driver. We don't know our Airbnb host. We are moving beyond that relational trust that, you know, I know so-and-so, therefore I'll buy from that company. We're actually moving to is that entity, is that government, is that corporation delivering on the values that I expect? And so when you jump into a car with a stranger that says, you know, has an Uber rideshare sticker on the back, you're putting your trust in a broader organisation. You know, the challenge for, for organisations like uh, government, like Salesforce, like Google, all of us, is about ensuring that ecosystem approach to how we deliver our services so everybody knows that when you're at the, you're the end user this is what you can expect from from that particular entity it's it's a it's a really um, significant challenge as we operate in these these broader environments thank you anybody else want to add to that okay Lucinda question from the pigeonhole for you um, we're reading more and more about cyber pandemics. Cyber criminals are taking advantage of the move to work from home. Where cyber is a growing risk, isn't there a public right to be concerned about data? Oh, absolutely. And um, thank you to, to the person who posted that question. It is critically important that we are all, as users, as members of the public, as well as regulators and policymakers, concerned about access to data, about uh, transparency around data and security of our data. And uh, along with privacy, the, uh, the, the treatment of data is at the core of Google's commitment to our users. Uh, and we do make those public commitments around data and transparency around our use of data critically important. As mentioned, I mentioned earlier, a lot of Google's products are free. Um, when you, you know, Google to, to see where you, you might uh, find a, a local pizza place or hairdresser when they're not in lockdown, um, then you're, you're in fact not even needing a Google account to be able to use those services. But a lot of our services are improved and do require information uh, about what you're searching for and, and are improved by data about uh, the way in which you search and the way in which you use the internet. Uh, in order to refine those services, it's critically important that we ensure that every user is informed, fully informed about our uses of data. For example, we have a commitment that we never sell personal data to anyone. We use a lot of that data as far as possible, aggregated and anonymized. Uh, it is not shared across platforms except as you consent. And the Google account, which is visited more than by more than 20 million people every day, you have full rights and ability to uh, to access your account, to control the data that is collected about you, to clear your data history, and we have data portability commitments and Google takeout, data takeout as well. So data is at the core of our economy. It's certainly at the core of Google's business model, and that commitment uh, is something that we all, as users, need to take up in order to understand the use of data and to build that 
trust uh, and our willingness to engage in platforms like Google's is dependent on that. Thank you. Minister, a question for you. How do we draw a line between CX, flexibility, privacy, and control? How do you draw a line between it? Um, Look, I've been a minister for almost uh, 11 years now and, and uh, you know, the, these issues constantly are something I've got to grapple with. And, and I, I'm looking for the, the nose ring that, you know, moves government, this big beast called government, uh, I- into a way that, that is, uh, you know, centralised around the individual. And uh, that nose ring is, in my view, uh, feedback. You know, I, I think if, if governments, when we, when we give service delivery, provide service delivery, whether it's health, education, what, transport, whatever it is, if we genuinely ask for feedback and, you know, as simple as thumbs up, thumbs down or, as them, or a comment, whatever the case is, and then we absorb it, understand it, and then close the loop on it, I think that is the ultimate place where we will get to a great landing in relation to uh, government service delivery trust, because um, ultimately, you know, the individual under suffrage gets a, a vote once every three or four years. But think about it: every time we deliver a service, whether it's when you try and renew your license, or you try and um, get uh, healthcare at a hospital, or you try and, uh, and get access to a, um, a registration or whatever. Uh, every time you access a service, you should be able to vote on that service with a uh, yes or a no. And if we then see, well, uh, we're getting a lot of these ones, then we will lift our game. I, every one of the every time a service delivery is is performed, it's a micro election. But it's only a micro election when you give people the opportunity to give authentic feedback. And I think. It's, it, it is a, a broad answer to a, a, a pretty broad question, mm-hmm. but it's but it's the thing that I'm probably the p- most passionate about because if we really tune in or tap in to what the genuine concerns are of the people in the day to day service delivery of government services, then we will improve services and then we will improve trust. Thank you. Um, a question for everybody on the panel, but I'll start with Natasha. Uh, do you believe Australia is moving fast enough when it comes to digital adoption? Uh, <laughs> I think, I mean, yes, uh, but certainly there's room for improvement. I, I think um, I think the challenge that we have now is that the, the digitization and the adoption is moving at such a pace that we can't regulate it. So hence, hence the deficit we're having in trust. Um, I, I think, yes, um, I think, you know, we, we absolutely could move faster. I think there's, you know, there's red tape involved, but I think the challenge that we have is, is regulating the speed um, of the digital economy. Stuart, if I could, if I could add just a brief, a briefly to that, I completely agree with Natasha's remarks. Uh, and and Google, Google works with about 1.3 million small businesses, uh, digital skilling, and and the demand and the uptake of digital skills uh, is extraordinary and and heartening. So, COVID has only accelerated that digital transformation. Uh, but I, I, I'm a Proud Australian, Google Australia is is about 1,800 people here. We we fiercely uh, advocate for Google's investments in Australia. Um, But to do that, the investment ecosystem in Australia, the enabling environment for technology innovation also needs to be supportive. Uh, And in that regard, in terms of digital uptake and and, and, uh, investment, uh, Australia is, is not well placed. 
Uh, we rank about, I think, 36 of 37 countries in the OECD in ICT investment. Uh, we are not going in the right direction in terms of World Economic Forum or World Intellectual Property Organization uh, rankings of innovation economies. And, and there is a, a great deal of potential for the government, a hugely burgeoning uh, tech sector. I think uh, the, the newly formed Technology Council has found that uh, Tech employs 861,000 Australians. It's a huge and growing economy here and, and there is great potential once that policy uh, ecosystem and policy um, and governance framework to regulate uh, and govern technology is, is properly put in place. I would also just add to what Lucinda said. I was just thinking as you were talking, Lucinda, about the Tech Council of Australia and the setup, and I think you know, the wonderful opportunity that we have here in the sector is we have these incredible success stories, these local homegrown unicorns. You have Canva, you have Atlassian, you have Afterpay, you have Zip, you have these incredible um, examples of technology innovation here that are, you know, doing amazing things globally. And so a consolidated effort by the tech sector, which is now happening with this setup of this new council, um, is only going to help um, speed up, you would hope, um, the government's interest and investment um, in the sector at large because without that, we, you know, we will continue to lose good people. We will continue to have our, um, our innovation hampered by the fact that the government is not keeping up with the sector at large. So it's a really good point. Stuart, if I, if I could add as well, like, yeah, you know, in New South Wales, we put $2.1 billion into a digital restart fund, which is, you know, historic in terms of its amount. But, and, and I am super ambitious for the, for the people of our state, uh, trust me. And, and I've seen in the last 18 months how the COVID wins have, uh, these bitter wins have actually put, uh, allowed us to put the digital spinnaker up and go really fast in terms of adoption. There's no doubt about that. You know, we can see through the use of the QR codes, the service app, the Dine and Discover vouchers, even digital driver's licence, it's gone up on scale uh, and right across the board. But I, when I look at what's going to happen in the next 10 years, 20 years, uh, and countries around the world and where we are sitting, it, it, it gives me real concern like we, we must move as a nation and fast we, we don't have the luxury to sit you know to pull the spinnaker down as it were and just cruise uh, we really this has to be a reckoning for us but the thing that again troubles me is that unless we get the trust structures right uh then we'll we'll go backwards at, much, um, at a much faster rate but if we get the trust structures right then we can really move forward at pace and, and provide leadership to the world. But these are big discussions this nation must have and now, now. And so take that further. How do we do it? Again, if we have a report that says we can save Australia and we as a collective yeah. can save Australia $224 billion over 10 years, the, the funding is there, but we need to get the voice. How do we get that voice and that focus? Yeah, look, it, it, you just need um, people like the people in this room today to keep talking, keep pressing. I know that, uh, you know, I'm doing my bit inside of government, but I'm just one that there's a lot of other leaders. Stu Roberts doing a great job at the federal level. I've got a lot of counterparts in other states, but it, it really needs to be elevated to the national conversation in the same way that climate change has been elevated to the national conversation. You know, th this is... This is a real threat to our, our security uh, moving forward if we don't get this right. Uh, like I, I look at India, for example. India, they've, they've got the India stack. What they're doing there is, you know, I don't know whether you like it or you dislike it, but what they are doing there is, is visionary, um, provided they've got the trust structures in place. Like we need to be having those type of conversations. We, you know, we're still struggling with um, digital identity. We got the trusted digital identity framework, but we're still struggling with that. You know, and, uh, you know, you put something up and then people start arcing back to the Australia card. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, the world has 
the, the world has not just changed. The universe has changed since that debate. Yet, um, anyway, so I, I think we need to elevate it to that national dialogue. Can I also just say, um, Minister, just to add to that, we now know from the data that um, Australians trust their employers more than they trust anybody else. I mean, you look at employers like Lucinda just said, um, Google has almost 2,000 employees. They trust Google more than they trust what the government is saying. Yeah. There is significant distrust with media. So I think the sector and business plays a significant part in elevating that conversation yeah, right. because, um, you know, companies are now the mouthpieces um, and they have a responsibility to actually play um, in this area and ensure that it, it is a key consideration, um, you know, at large. And to augment that, and Natasha, I completely agree. Um, but when we talk about the digital economy, and the, the government has has developed its digital economy strategy. Um, certainly, companies like Google and and the, the amazing Australian homegrown tech companies that you mentioned that are active in the Tech Council um, definitely are at the the forefront of of those questions about responsibility and trust. But when we talk the digital economy, there are very few companies, industries in Australia that are not part of that discussion. We are all digital now and we all have a part to play in building that trust and engagement. And I, on, on the part of, of the work that the Australian government needs to do to the minister's comments, I completely agree. And we'd very much like to be part of that and supporting the government in those discussions. I had joined Google from, from an international role working with the United Nations and what I can say is that Australia is not alone in grappling with these issues. Uh, we share a, a common struggle across the world in, in for governments to determine how to govern technology, fully realise the benefits of innovation for their populations, uh, but also maintain those safeguards. Uh, so Australia has a, it has a commonality there, but enormous potential because of the benefits that we have here in, in a, a stable democracy. Lucinda, if you don't mind, I'm going to pick up on exactly that point there as well. You know, the idea of defining what a digital economy these days, I challenge most people to do that because as far as you know, our experiences in everyday life uh, would uh, indicate it's actually just the economy because there is no longer a distinction between the two. And this comes back down to our ability, not only as a, a sector, but as um as people in the media, as in government, are uh, all uniting around at least some commonality that technology can be used to deliver this net benefit for the citizen, for the Australian business as a whole, whether that be through, you know, the employment piece that we, we've spoken about before and in previous times, or whether it's um, actually allowing mum and dad who own the corner shop, shop to sell better, to deliver better, to you know, increase of revenue for, for themselves to build a better life for themselves. That's what technology is there to be used for if delivered in, obviously, you know, if the, the trust structures are there, as, as the minister pointed out, then and if we build in that that equity and transparency into the, into the technology, we then, the next step for us is to sell the benefit, the be net benefit for each person in their everyday lives is how it will augment the everyday and keep Australia to be, being the, the lifestyle superpower that we effectively are. So, uh, and, and that, that is the, the opportunity that lies before us. And I think it's certainly one that we are on the cusp of being able to, to crack. Thank you. Um, Giselle, Another one for you from the pigeonhole. Um, how concerning is the current shortage in skills in the ICT sector in Australia? Stuart, it's such an important question, and I'm sure all of everybody on this in this room today could can has a. a a very strong view on this. It really is an issue. Um, you know, uh, with the current border closures in particular, I would challenge to find a, an organisation, whether truly defined as a technology organisation or otherwise, who are struggling to find the skills that they need. And, and this is because, you know, it comes back to our earlier point, how do you define tech, tech roles? Tech roles exist not only in the technology industry, but in 
in our major telcos, in our airlines, in our banks, in the, you know, the, the whole gov- in government. Um, and the only way we're going to be able to drive the change that we've articulated on the call today is to have more people situated in all of the organisations that can drive change, private, public or private, who can really understand what needs to be done, put the customer at the centre, use the technology to work back from there. But it's not just ICT alone. It needs to be coupled with the multidisciplinary disciplinary teams of, you know, change management, because at the end of the day, it's it's human-centred design that operates really well with technology. Those skills combine, unite to, to create and ignite the change that we we want to see. So, you know, fr- from our perspective, we, we certainly see it. We see it not only in our sector, but also in, uh, you know, I work in, in the public sector space. I see it in our public sector organisations that they're looking for skills. But it's about, you know, if we highlight in the the consciousness of most Australians that technology is not just something, you know, separate to your everyday, but, you know, it's its own literacy, just like numeracy and, and, and general literacy, you find that everybody will have a basic competence and then you, you in the, in that respect alone will start overcoming some of those skills and we and we've seen you know some, some fantastic uh, government uh, services that have gone to start try alleviate that that deficit internally but there's still a lot more to be done but i think that issue is about why why should why um, adopt digital and, and if, if I could add also, I completely agree with Giselle and, and we, among all other companies relying on engineering and tech skills, are uh, uh, in a highly competitive environment for skills there. And so we are very much also focused on be building domestic capability and capacity. How do we invest in, in bringing school age children to be excited in STEM, to focus on underrepresented communities, women, indigenous and and rural and regional communities where there is enormous talent. Uh, And so bringing up IT skills and STEM skills, but also in those emerging capabilities, emerging technologies, areas like artificial intelligence or machine learning and quantum computing, uh, where Australia really has, because of our exceptionally good universities and and research facilities, where there is capacity to partner and to create that local capacity that will make Australia globally competitive in those areas. Is there anything people are doing that's quite innovative to solve that problem today? Because we we suffer the same thing on our side as well. Um, And you can see that inflection point. If the title of this conversation is building trust in technology and we're achieving that but we don't have the infrastructure below it to support its continuous growth we're going to get to a point where we're going to plateau out and other countries will overtake us is there anything anybody's doing with unique initiatives to try and solve the problem of building that long-term dare i say pipeline of it uh, infrastructure in the education sector i I think uh, I think everybody is doing something. Um, honestly, Stuart, I think I think big business um, is trying really hard to um, to identify and incentivize the sector. Um, to Lucinda's point, the issue we're having is STEM in schools. Um, particularly young women are opting out of STEM subjects in high school, which is precluding them from entering STEM-based university degrees because they don't have the basics that they need. But young people at large don't realise the breadth of opportunity that there is in STEM. Um, So I think that, you know, my understanding certainly is that big tech in Australia is, is playing a really significant part in trying to increase from a higher education standpoint before young people are actually getting into university to incentivize STEM, but it takes time. Um, and it's just one of those things that we need everyone as a collective to play their part in. Stuart, I remember uh, listening to Harari when he said that uh, in, in previous generations, we'd be building employment um, temples you might have one or two, but now we have to have tents. You might because you might have twenty different jobs, and uh, one of the biggest challenges we've got is labour market mobility. How how we move from tent to tent to tent to tent. So that that spawned the idea of creating an education passport in New South Wales that we're building out. So you know, from primary school to high school to TAFE to university to AICD, whatever it is, 
uh, you carry with you, uh, ideally in your service app, uh, all your qualifications and like. Now, where does that take you? Well, that takes you to then we start uh, talking to uh, em employment providers uh, such as Seek and the, and the like. And, and what they can do with that is then start matching supply and demand. And once we've got that visibility along that supply line, it's much easier to say to a primary school kid or a high school kid, hey, look, if you go into these industries, this is what opens up for you down, downstream. Uh, it's, it's just, just connecting those, those, um, those dots. We're hoping to have this product uh, starting to trial out uh, in early next year. But if we can land this, this would be world leading if we land it. But I'm determined to do it because it is. It really will go a long way to, to solving this problem. And it's not just in STEM. There could be other issues. It, we, we might have a crisis in nursing downstream. But you know, unless we see it and can show it, uh, then it's, it's, you know, if we can see it and show it, then it's easy for people to follow that path. Thank you. I'm absolutely honoured to be a part of this conversation today. I'm also honoured to be part of the Australian journey to what I think will be a story that will take Australia to another level and another definition in a world scale. We're doing things here that nobody else is doing and we're, we're punching much faster than others are. And I'm proud to be part of that journey. And I just want to thank everybody for being on the panel today and having this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll hand over. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, thank you uh, for an interesting concluding today's discussion. Uh, can I thank you personally and also extend Cedar's thanks to Technology One for, for sponsoring uh, the discussion. Cedar is as strong as its uh, members uh, allow us to, and, and we certainly acknowledge Technology One's support. Um, can I also make a special thanks to our speakers for volunteering their time and insights uh, to today's discussion? Uh, and, and a reminder goes out to all attendees today to take a moment to rate their experience of today's live stream in our Pigeonhole app and to keep uh, an eye out for a post-event email, which will include a link to today's live stream recordings, which we encourage you all to share with your colleagues. Uh, to stay in touch uh, with CEDAR and, and upcoming uh, discussions, please visit cedar.com.au where you can uh, register for upcoming uh, live streams. Um, but that certainly uh, for, for now concludes today's uh, discussion. Good afternoon and stay safe.